Hello, thank you for joining us again on Interesting Individuals. I am Bill Landing. Spring is upon us. It's the baseball season 2002, and I'm going to do a program on the national pastime, baseball. Going to do something a little different here. Going to go through some of the interesting facts and history on baseball, some of the things that maybe people don't know about. Naturally, there are dozens of different stories and people that can be profiled on Major League Baseball. But again, we're going to try to go through some of the things that people don't know about, maybe some records or incidents and events that happened in the sport that, again, you are not aware of. We'll maybe have some fun little sketches dramatizing some of the famous events. But please stay with us. It is time to play ball. The classic story, Casey at the Bat, dates way back to June of 1888. The story has drama and suspense, and it also has a surprise ending. With several thousand fans in attendance at the game, we wonder what some of them might have been like that day. Jimmy, that Casey is quite a man. Bat Boy! Oh, Bat Boy! Please send this note to Casey. I'm Monica Quonset. I live on Blaisdell Street along with a lot of other wealthy families. My father's retired colonel with the Civil War. He was a Confederacy. I would like to have Casey join us for dinner on Sunday at our home. I have a feeling Casey's going to make quite an impact on today's game. The outlook wasn't brilliant for the Mudville Nine that day. The score stood 4-2 to two with but one inning more to play. And then when Cooney died at first and Barrows did the same, a sickly silence fell upon the patrons of the game. A straggling few got up to go in deep despair. The rest clung to that hope which springs eternal in the human breast. They thought if only Casey could get but a whack at that, we'd put up even money now with Casey at the bat. But Flynn preceded Casey, as did also Jimmy Blake, and the former was a Lulu and the latter was a cake. So upon that stricken multitude grim melancholy sat, for there seemed but little chance of Casey's getting to the bat. But Flynn let drive a single to the wonderment of all, and Blake, the much despised, tore the cover off the ball. And when the dust had lifted and the men saw what had occurred, there was Johnny safe at second and Flynn a hugging third. Then from five thousand throats and more there rose a lusty yell. It rumbled through the valley, it rattled in the dell. It knocked upon the mountain and recoiled upon the flat, for Casey, mighty Casey, was advancing to the bat. There was ease in Casey's manner as he stepped into his place. There was pride in Casey's bearing and a smile on Casey's face. And when responding to the cheers, he lightly doffed his hat. No stranger in the crowd could doubt twas Casey at the bat. Ten thousand eyes were on him as he rubbed his hands with dirt. Five thousand tongues applauded when he wiped them on his shirt. Then while the writhing pitcher ground the ball into his hip, Defiance gleamed in Casey's eye, a sneer curled Casey's lip. And now the leather-covered sphere came hurtling through the air, and Casey stood a-watching it in haughty grandeur there. Close by the sturdy batsman, the ball unheeded sped. That ain't my style, said Casey. Strike one, the umpire said. From the benches, black with people, there went a muffled roar, like the beating of the storm waves on a stern and distant shore. Kill him, kill the umpire, shouted someone in the stands, and it's likely they'd have killed him had not Casey raised his hand. With a smile of Christian charity great, Casey's visage shone. He stilled the rising tumult, he bade the game go on. He signaled to the pitcher, and once more the spheroid flew. But Casey still ignored it, and the umpire said, strike two. Fraud, cried the maddening thousands, and echo answered fraud. But one scornful look from Casey and the audience was awed. They saw his face grow stern and cold. They saw his muscles strain, and they knew Casey wouldn't let that ball go by again. The sneer is gone from Casey's lip. His teeth are clenched in hate. He pounds with cruel violence his bat upon the plate. And now the pitcher holds the ball, and now he lets it go. And now the air is shattered by the force of Casey's blow. Oh, somewhere in this favored land, the sun is shining bright. The band is playing somewhere, and somewhere hearts are light. And somewhere men are laughing, and somewhere children shout. But there is no joy in Mudville. Mighty Casey has struck out. 
The Cy Young Award is given out each year to a pitcher in both leagues for outstanding pitching accomplishments. The award is named after Cy Young, the pitcher who won 511 games more than any other pitcher in baseball history. Young pitched from 1890 to 1911, but did you know that Young pitched in 40 or more games a season 15 times and even topped 50 on at least five occasions? And also that he won 30 games or more a season six times and won 20 or more games an additional nine times. Young also pitched a staggering 400 plus innings a year five times and he eclipsed 300 or more innings a year a total of 16 times. What would his services bring on the free agent market today? In the entire history of Major League Baseball only 24 men thus far have reached and surpassed 3,000 hits. However, did you know that of the 24 players, 16 ball players have accomplished this since 1970, and eight ball players joined the elite group in the 1990s more than any other decade. It shows just what caliber of hitters have existed in the major leagues in the last 30 years. Winning the Triple Crown in baseball is an extremely difficult thing to do. To qualify for this, a player must lead his league in home runs, batting average, and runs batted in. Since 1901, only 12 ball players have done this, and amazingly enough, two players have done it twice. Rogers Hornsby of the St. Louis Cardinals did it in 1922 and 25, and Ted Williams did it in 1942 and 47. And did you know that two ball players won the Triple Crown in the same year? 1933, Jimmy Fox of the Philadelphia A's of the American League and Chuck Klein of the Philadelphia Phillies. So Philly fans were certainly happy that year. Other noteworthy players to bag the Triple Crown were Ty Cobb and Mickey Mantle. And two players did it in back-to-back -back seasons, Frank Robinson of the Baltimore Orioles in 1966 and then again by Carl Yastrzemski of the Red Sox in 1967. Since 67, no ball player has won the Triple Crown in either league. It's tough to hit 300 in baseball, let alone try to hit 400, but it has been done 13 times by eight players. To do this, a player practically has to get a hit, if not two hits, in every game. A player also can't really go more than two games without a hit to stay in the 400 range. No one has batted 400 since Ted Williams in 1941. Two ball players, incredibly enough, did it three times, that being Ty Cobb in 1911, 12, and then again in 1922, and Rogers Hornsby in 1922, 24, and then again in 1925. George Slisser did it twice in 1920 and then in 1922, and the highest batting average ever recorded for a player in a full season was Napoleon Lajoey in 1901 at 426. Chicago is a strong sports town, and when it comes to baseball, the city frequently gets divided. There are the Cub fans and then the White Sox fans, and there has been a hated rivalry between the two, even though they play in different leagues. The teams do play each other at least two or three times a year, and the winner gets bragging rights. But they have not met in a World Series but once, nearly 100 years ago in 1906. The Cubs that year were the runaway favorites as they won a record 116 games. The Cubs had the now legendary players Tinkers, Evers, and Chance. This was player manager Frank Chance at first, Johnny Evers at second, and Joe Tinker at shortstop. All of these players would wind up in the Cooperstown Hall of Fame. However, many may not know that the three men never liked one another and hardly spoke to one another other than being on the ball diamond. The star pitcher for the Cubs that year was Mordecai Three Finger Brown. He won 26 games. The Cubs' opponents in the World Series that year was the South Siders, the White Sox, who had won 93 games. They were labeled the Hitless Wonders because their team batting average was only 230 and no player batted higher than 280. However, they did have one 20 game winner in Nick Alrock. The Cubs naturally were strong favorites to win, but the White Sox won Game 1, 2-1, to one, Game 3, 3 to nothing, and Game 5, 8-6, to six, and then they beat Brown in Game 6, 8-3, to three, for a surprising series victory over the Cubs. The Sox had proven they were no easy touch as they played well and pitched well. For the Cubs, it would get better as they would win the World Series in both 1907 and again in 1908. But the two teams of the Windy City have never faced each other in the Fall Classic since. 
It's still hard to believe it actually happened that a group of ball players would purposely lose a World Series. In 1919, players on the Chicago White Sox did just that. The team was owned by Charles A. Comiskey, who was tight-fisted. Not many are aware that the White Sox had won the World Series in 1917, beating the New York Giants. To get even with Comiskey and win money, eight of the players conspired with gamblers to throw the series against the Cincinnati Reds. The main man bankrolling the fix was New York gangster Arnold Rothstein. The players would collect upwards from ten to twenty thousand dollars in the best of nine contest. Naturally, the other players and manager were unaware of the dastardly deed. However, a few days before the series began, rumors started as more betting went to Cincinnati to win the series over the favored Sox. The Sox on paper looked good. They led the American League in wins, base hits, and team batting average and had two 20-plus game winning pitchers. The series opened in Cincinnati and the Sox lost 9-1 to with pitcher Eddie Sicotti, a 29-game winner, grooving good pitches to the Reds. The Sox fielders also botched several plays. Game 2 saw 23-game winner Lefty Williams lose 4-2. to Turmoil erupted after this game when Sox manager Kid Gleason and first baseman Chick Gandel, the brain behind the fix, had a physical altercation and catcher Ray Schalk not in on the scheme and pitcher Williams went at one another. Comiskey and the other Sox players were amazed at how their play in the series was so bad. The series then shifted to Chicago, but even down two to nothing, the city was full of excitement and some of the players had fun in establishments before game three. Hey, hey, hey. The way you and your teammates are celebrating, it's hard to believe you lost the first two games of the series. Oh, we were just a little flat. Now that we're back home, we should win this thing without any problems. What's this talk about gamblers fixing the series so you guys will lose? That's just the newspapers and low-life bums just trying to start trouble. Now that we're home, we'll win this thing easily. I sure do hope so, because if you do, we're going to have one big celebration. Oh. Game three was won by the Sox three to nothing as pitcher Dickie Kerr, not in on the fix, shut out the Reds on three hits. The Reds came back to take game four two to nothing, and then game five five to nothing. The teams traveled back to Cincinnati for game six. There had been some conflict between the players and gamblers, as the players had not been given some of the amounts they'd been promised after losing the first two games. The players did have second thoughts about abandoning their plan. The Sox came to life winning game six, five to four, and game seven, four to one. Sox fans began to feel their team would triumph, but a threat had been made to pitcher Lefty Williams that if he did not lose the final game, harm would come to him and his family. The eighth and final game of the 1919 World Series was won by Cincinnati, 10 to five.